time is yours you will tell me that time we meet my i and dr pachore when we were in pune we discussed that but um, certainly this week i'll i'll make a point to come and meet you definitely don't mm. okay mm. boss so okay good evening uh, friends and colleagues um it's pleasure to invite you again today for the isks academic program uh, this is the uh, the session like the previous we have heap and knee topics and i have pleasure to have our managing trustee dr vikram shah and our patron dr pachore uh, both have joined they have been always joining in all the programs uh at this juncture i take opportunity to um inform all of our friends colleagues faculties and all the junior doctors that we have an upcoming uh, 17th isk annual meeting 2024 in calcutta on 5th 6th and 7th april the early bird registration is already open uh i can tell you it's going to be a fantastic academic program and we have a large very eminent faculties coming from australia england usa uh from germany uh, they are going to be live plus the south asian countries um indonesia uh, bangladesh um and other countries very eminent people from all these countries are going to come along with of course our own uh, big stalwarts national faculties and it's going to be very uh useful and a very packed academic program so please uh, take note of this um and early bird registration is already open there are special uh, uh packages for the post graduate students we have made it uh, cheaper for them so please take uh, the benefit of that part also um after this the the main point is the today's topic uh, usually we do the hip first but this time uh, we are doing the knee first we have a very senior uh, and uh, eminent knee surgeon from mumbai dr nilen shah uh, he is practicing in mumbai for many years and we all know him as a subvastus man he is the one who has popularized this practicing it very well uh in his routine surgery in the knee approach of course he is not going to talk on the subvastus today but it is his pet the uh, things and he has he put you muted yourself he country uh, along with uh, his other interest is in the um morbid patients uh, tunicular surgeries and he has been working on a uh, number of other uh, things which he has been presenting his today's topic is uh, mainly the satisfaction after the uh, knee replacement surgery we all know the literature says that's one out of five uh, are not happy so um, of course that figure is going down now with lot of factors but why our patients though the extra looks fine uh, they are not very happy so a good friend of us Uh, mine and uh, with the presence of dr vikram shah and dr pachore also here uh, dr danasekar raja my colleague who is the member of the education committee of this along with him i welcome all of you uh, all the fec- uh, the friends uh, the participants and it give me a good uh, great pleasure to welcome dr nilen shah uh, on this uh is academic program and request him to share the slide and uh, give his talk welcome dr nilen thank you very much deepak bhai uh my greetings to dhanshekar raja pachore sahab vikram bhai and to all the delegates who have joined 
I will I will try to share my thoughts about satisfaction although i have some problem about sharing okay can you all see my screen Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen, sir. You just have to open the presentation. Uh, sir, I think you've joined two times uh, in the same. Okay. Uh, you can just uh, leave the meeting, and you can just click on leave there on the bottom. Shall I leave? Yes, sir. Yes. Now you can share the yes. Okay. So you can see the first slide. Yes, everybody can see. Uh, it's still not full screen. Sir. Yeah. Full full screen, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, friends. So ensuring satisfaction after knee replacements. So as Deepak Bhai had said that dissatisfaction after a knee replacement is variously described up to 20% in Western literature. And there is this article in the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2019, which said this. So dissatisfaction may be knee related where there is residual pain, restricted movement, unmet expectations, or some complication due to the knee replacement, or it could be unrelated to the knee replacement, where the pain is unrelated to the knee, or the patient has had some adverse experience. So 50% of the patients are unhappy for reasons other than the knee replacement. So I have formed rule number one, which is that the surgeon, the primary surgeon is responsible, not just for the technical excell excellence of the knee replacement, but for the overall management and the experience that the patient has whilst undergoing a knee replacement. We have just had a cricket season. So we need to hit a four or a six. So there are four things which we need to do. We need to choose the right patient, do the right surgery, be the right doctor and ensure the right experience. So if we do these four things, we are hitting the ball for a four. But if we want a six, then we have to manage the costs in our country and we have to manage the social aspects of knee replacements also well. So if we do all these six things, then we are hitting the ball out of the park. We are hitting a six. So which patient should we be choosing? The patient must have mechanical knee arthritic pain, which is disturbing lifestyle 
an X-ray shows bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. There should be minimal to no extraneous factors, no claudication, no neurolog neurological factors, no hip arthritis, vascular okay, psychological factors okay, and the patient should be a good surgical candidate of an appropriate age. We should counsel the patients so that the patient's expectations match realistic results. We should judge the patient and the relatives and we should allow buying rather than hard selling of our surgery. As many as 50% of the patients undergoing a total joint replacement have some psychological factors which can be measured by the anxiety and depression score by SF36 or pain catastrophizing scale. And all these factors do have a bearing on the result of the knee replacement. Obviously, we cannot become psychiatrists, but we need to be aware that these things are there. So we should be able to correlate symptoms, pathology and physical sign, spend time with the patient and relatives, operate only on genuine pathology, and we may involve other people of our team so that we get a clear picture of what the patient has. So there is this whole American Academy of Hip and Knee Surgeons symposium on the psychology of total joint arthroplasty, where it is said that patient dissatisfaction can be high because of psychological factors. And if the person is able to demonstrate resilience, then these people typically do well after the surgery. If we are operating in younger patients, we need to be aware that these people have a higher revision rate. So it is better to manage these patients with conservative measures or may consider an osteotomy. It is very well shown that the younger the patient, the lesser is the five-year survival rate after knee replacement surgery. We have to screen the patients well. So you may involve others, but finally, in our Indian setting, it is the surgeon who is operating and has to take responsibility. There was a study done which asked the patients what is their greatest fear of patients undergoing knee replacement. So most people said that the pain in the perioperative period was their greatest fear. So surgeon needs to ensure that the post knee replacement patient is not like an accident victim. So my rule number two is that the surgeon is responsible not just for the long term relief of pain, but also for pain management in the immediate perioperative period. As we all know, in our Indian setting, surgery like birth of a baby or death in the family is a social event. And most relatives or friends are going to visit that patient in the evening. And the opinion about the ability or lack of ability of the surgeon is formed as to by how that patient is feeling and performing or walking or that patient has pain in the evening of surgery when we may be seeing other patients. So we must take responsibility and ensure that our immediate perioperative pain management is excellent. So we should have an anesthetist who is the best but who is prepared for the worst should remain in theater, should be time efficient, should be familiar with spinal epidural general anesthesia and peripheral nerve blocks. Perioperative pain management is multimodal, patient controlled analgesia, systemic steroids, analgesics, intraarticular cocktails, epidural, peripheral nerve blocks, femoral or adductor, and obviously, the current literature and my choice is favoring adductor canal blocks. ACB, in my opinion, is a game changer 
where you can do an ultrasound in the theater it can be easy but requires some training catheter near the femoral artery in the mid thigh it blocks the saphenous nerve and really produces good pain relief and this blocks the nerve after quadriceps motor branches are given out so there is no weakness and the patient's recovery can be dramatic the motor recovery we have done a lot of studies about the adductor canal blocks and i will just share a couple of papers where this is published in the journal of arthroplasty where we showed that the adductor canal block has a better functional recovery but the pain control is similar to femoral nerve block and that continuous adductor canal block is better than a single shot adductor canal block further to this we have also started giving surgeon administered direct adductor adductor canal block and we have shown that this is as good as ultrasound guided blocks and i have just finished a trial of acb catheter inserted by the surgeon we have also and compared it to the usg guided acb catheter inserted by the anesthetist and found that these results can also be very very similar so here what i am trying to emphasize is that perioperative pain management is so important that we should really put our effort and energy further to make this. our patients comfortable generally perioperative steroids were shunned by the all and sundry because it was thought that this would cause greater infection but evidence shows that without increasing the infection risk this can reduce pain and post operative nausea vomiting and we should be using these because this makes our patient much more comfortable obviously we need to do the right surgery we need to avoid complications and to do that either we do a partial knee replacement or a total knee replacement so knees that require a total knee replacement we have to do a total knee replacement but knees which are suitable for partial we can do a partial knee replacement or a total knee replacement there was a total of partial knee arthroplasty trial involving lots and lots of patient 2019 and the recommendation from this knee trial was that partial knee replacement can offer a quicker recovery with equivalent or better oxford knee score so a suitable partial in suitable patients in trained hands Further can work this, well we have also and this was exactly the same conclusion which we had published in 1998 anybody is interested this is published in british jbjs where we showed that a suitable partial can give uh, good results in suitable patients so knee arthroplasty when you are performing you need to perform it through a suitable adequate approach rehearse steps familiar team and we should anticipate and avoid complications an approach is a matter of choice personally as deepak bhai said for me it is subvastus for all and even lateral subvastus whether the knee is valgus ob stiff revisions or re-revisions subvastus can be performed and i have done it more than 15000 times and we have published it our results in obese patients in valgus knees in stiff knees and even in revisions we should avoid intraoperative catastrophes either fracture extensor mechanism injury mcl damage vascular or neurological damage so what are the my tips to avoid fractures do adequate ligament release use spacer blocks and not lamina spreaders be careful with spikes and levers and applying and removing jigs and trials avoid notching no forcible hammering and most important thing is that we need to be gentle very often we find that it's a young athletic orthopedic surgeon operating on a 80 year old or a 90 year old 
and we need to be careful because we are much more powerful than our old patients and we must avoid fractures we should be very very careful while inserting or removing jigs remove in the same direction so that we don't enlarge any of the peg holes that we have made for our implants what are the knees at risk of soft tissue injury morbidly obese knees stiff knees where there is a lot of osteophytosis patella baha so we need to be more careful in these kind of patients removal of osteophytes should be a graded exposure and release no forcible flexion and we need to control enthusiastic assistance so that we avoid any catastrophes exposure osteophyte removal and release these are all interlinked processes and we should remove osteophytes before any major ligamentous releases there can be other complications instability infection patellar issues stiffness wound healing problems or residual pain it is very important to do a thorough eua before starting the surgery greater is the instability of the knee lesser should be the bone cuts if we find that the deformity is uncorrectable then ligament release is required if it is correctable then very often there is a bony defect if the knee is lax lax our bone cut should be minimal if there is global laxity we may need a stabilized implant so these kind of uh, rather than just starting with the surgery initially you should spend some time examining the knee under anesthesia so that you get the feel of the knee after the bone resections use a spacer block move from extension and flexion and feel and now you avoid multiple trial reductions in osteoporotic patients i tend to preserve the pcl because i believe it is a flexion check rein and i selectively release it to titrate the flexion gap this can be as easy or as difficult as balancing the mcl and different shape inserts that are now available in most uh, systems are a big bonus and we have presented our experience of cr knee in gross deformities as well now what is a balanced knee very often this is uh, different in different people's hands so i'll just tell you what i believe is a balanced knee it should have 1 to 2 mm of opening maybe a touch more lateral than medial 1 to 2 mm of forward translation no backward translation and just a touch of hyper extension there should be no lift off no squeaking and we should be able to insert the trial insert by hand without excessive force we should avoid malalignment now there are various systems in which you can align a knee i am still a mechanical aligner so for me femoral and tibial cuts i like to get them perpendicular to the mechanical axis difficult to get the femoral cut perpendicular due to the femoral bow and the head of the femur being non palpable tibia is easier to feel as it is subcutaneous so i see the merit of navigating the distal femoral cut and the rest can be all routine so we have navigated only the distal femoral cut and published our results in the journal of arthroplasty and we showed that it can be as good in improving alignment as full navigation currently robotics is available at select centers needs additional pins in the femur and tibia the experience is growing but the unrealistic expectations of the patients can become counterproductive we must avoid infection so here also i feel there is a little change in concept that it is not just bad luck we should ask the patient to decolonize from the staff by taking chlorhexidine baths we should reduce the nasal colonization also by using mupirocin reduce surgical time use antibiotic loaded cement and if you find that in the post operative period there is some problem with the wound healing we should aspirate early and wash out early so early knee infection should be treated 
as a make or break case we should take cultures before antibiotics and this should be treated as a very very important case not to be left to any junior by reducing the morbidity of tk i find that if you are not using a tunica you can reduce the morbidity you may avoid routine icu stay avoid urinary catheterization reduce the need for blood transfusion and mobilize the patients early we have done some studies how to reduce blood loss in knee replacement tranexamic acid is a game changer and we have shown that combined administration of systemic and topical tranexamic acid can be a better regime we can use intraarticular tranexa after capsular closure and oral tranexa for around 3 days post knee replacement can also reduce blood loss so what is the right surgery according to me well balanced well aligned stable knee with excellent tracking good range of movement the knee has to be durable may use measured resection may navigate the distal femoral cut may use robotics cr or ps is a personal preference i use subvastus tunica less and generally cemented knees now this is very important that we need to be available for follow up we need to arrange more follow ups of required and we need to listen to our patients as to what they are saying we may arrange patient friendly social programs where the patients can see us as a person as a human being and not just as a doctor so that the bond between patients and us is further strengthened this uh, symposium about patient dissatisfaction of the primary total joint arthroplasty said that we must put patients first before ourselves so to be the right doctor we need to think from the patient's point of view we should have empathy genuine care that shows we should be available we have to listen we have to give time and we also need to think of costs involved for our patients so we have to in, ensure the right environment so the outpatient clinic admission process nursing staff insurance physiotherapy junior staff state of the hospitals catering all these things although not directly under us make a bearing as to patient satisfaction so we should ensure that these are as good as possible we should make arrangements so that the patients can seek help after discharge and we have to care such that it shows there's a hans christian andersen had said that just living is not enough one must have sunshine freedom and a little flower i have paraphrased this sentence only doing a knee replacement is not enough we must align balance and care patient reported outcome measures proms so there is this article which talks about a net promoter score this is published in the british journal of bone and joint surgery where it says that when you have done a particular procedure after that you may have promoters who will be saying that you must go and get this procedure done by this individual you may have detractors who say that you should never get this procedure done by you and there will be some passives who say yes i have done the procedure and he is all right so the industry that means the car manufacturers are apples samsung telephones all these people believe that if you have a net promoter score of 30 it is very very good so we put questions to our post knee replacement patients at one year two questions are you satisfied and will you recommend this doctors to others so we did this study when the national lockdown started 
we asked all our patients by a telephonic call and we found that 95% of the patients were satisfied with a 96% net promoter score this is unpublished data as yet that means 860 out of 883 patients so we should be aiming from patient satisfaction to patient delight by these tricks and the methods and the care that i have showed you thank you for your attention dr nilen it was super wonderful i think it's your uh, we can say the conclusion of your life uh, so 30 years of experience you have just uh, very nicely crafted into this giving so many points thank um, you i think you will be able to get some uh, questions there uh, on the chat box but before that i just want to ask you one question sure. you put lot of stress on two points uh, one is the pain management and yes. second is the the psychological problems i'm going to ask dr vikram uh, shah uh, the the man at the shelby hospital he has done some uh, uh, change in his practice i'm going to come back to him uh, after uh, the first question to you so how much importance you give to the preemptive analgesis yeah, the previous nights do you uh, have a, a role to play in your practice are you asking me or vikram yes yeah, no i'm asking this question to you uh see preemptive analgesia i am not giving and there was a talk about giving pregabalin to our patients and there were some reports which said that by giving that the patient's pain is much lesser but uh, i did not find that helpful in our in my practice and i okay. think there was some literature which showed that if you give them celebrex also they are comfortable so most of my surgeries are done under spinal and i ensure that nsaids are given to the patient whilst the person is still under the effect of spinal yeah, so you you try to break the cycle of the pain before the pain establishes yes we, yes uh, we do that my second question is about your adductor canal blocked by the surgeon do we do with the same incision do we need to extend the incision proximally uh, no this is this is we have just finished the study on this mm. and without without extending the incision we have been able to put the adductor canal blocks it's easier when you are doing a subvastus approach because the adductor membrane is just there in front of you right okay i will wait for that reports to come out uh, dr vikram shah uh, i just want to ask you i have heard you in one of the meetings that uh, you have been giving lot of importance to the point which dr nilen has ma made uh is psychological counseling um can you just some throw light on that again is it to vikram or to me no to vikram dr vikram are you on can you hear me oh uh, i can i can hear you uh what we have found over the years is that uh, particularly indian females are having lot of psychological issues because of disability and a uh, lot of social and family constraints and uh, mm -hmm. these patients are hugely moneyed also it doesn't have anything to do with money <clears throat> males don't have that big a problem we hardly find 1% of male having problem but uh, 40% of females have borderline or serious issues as far as psychological issues are concerned and uh, some are on medicines some are not some because you know they have always found it as a taboo to go to psych psychiatrist and other things so we have a full time psychologists employed in our hospitals and they take round of all the patients and they find out 
borderline and serious patients where they need to spend more and more time even post operative time and even pre operative also they spend good amount of time and it has helped us hugely to reduce later on repeated consultation in our office post operatively saying pain and uh, discomfort and unhappiness it has made huge difference good i i think these are very two important points uh, brought out uh, by dr vikram shah and dr nilain uh, dr pachore anything else you would like to add on this dr pachore yes. are you on the devak can you hear me yes we can we can i just want to know from all of you what is the role of pre operative counseling uh if you ask me my uh, i think line what uh, nilen has put in his slide please give them the realistic picture see what is happening we give them so much of rosy picture uh which is not true all the time so i think the most important point is Uh, and i think nilan has already mentioned that we don't sell this surgery to them let them buy uh, that's the important point if you really want the patients to be satisfied afterwards so not to give too unrealistic i think he has already mentioned in the slide that the expectation has to be realistic but we have a role to play when we tell them that you need this surgery we should certainly tell them th these are the limitations this much you can do you will certainly be benefited your pain will go your deformity will be corrected so and so but i think we should try to be a little careful in increasing their expectation during our counseling this is what i feel dr vikram same thing i think milan has summarized this fantastically and uh, i have nothing else to add so the words deepak bhai if i may say generally what i tell the patients is that the surgery will definitely be beneficial but it is not magic it will make a material difference to your life but you will be able to live like whatever your otherwise your age and physical ability is you will be able to live like that person <clears throat> correct uh dr raja okay go ahead yeah dr pachore carry on carry on you said the role of uh, dexamethasone or steroid uh, this is just uh, how many doses or is just uh, what or you continue for 2 3 days uh see if you read the literature about perioperative steroids and joint replacement i think there is no consensus in the world currently the way i use it is that on induction all patients get 8 mg of dexamethasone on induction and they also get it the next day in my periarticular cocktail also i use kenacott because we just did one study at salvi and uh, with a prospective randomized control trial of uh, using a single dose and and 50 patient single 100 patient single dose and without there is no question that 48 24 hours uh, the, there was a lot of difference in the pain and there was also the inflammatory markers were down the crp those who received the dose so yes. definitely it is uh, one of the great yeah which one should use it when the patients are not very highly diabetic they are very very well controlled so this is what is our our, our observation recently so is a single yes. dose steroid at the time of induction dr pachore yes yeah, single dose intravenous yeah just like what nilen said mm -hmm. no okay. i use two doses huh? you you give one next day also mm. yes yes okay fine and uh, would you avoid this in diabetic patients i would generally not avoid it 
Right. I have not. I I I mean, this is now stretching my neck out a little bit. I I have not had a primary knee infection for a very very long time with whatever I am doing. And if the diabetes is reasonably controlled, I I feel that it is still safe. And there are reports also which say that there is uh, literature to support what I am saying. Good. Uh, Dr. Raja, are you there? Vinay? Yes, sir. Taking a little uh, too is, far. Is, is Dr. Dhanashekar Raja there? Yes, yes. He is uh, connected. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, 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 Nilen, can you see any, any uh, questions on your... Uh, because I am not able to see the questions. Oh, Oh, I can't really see the question. Yeah, right? okay. So there is a question. CHG bath. Is Savlon soap bath is enough or you prefer CHG? Nilayne. Uh, I prefer chlorhexidine gluconate. Huh? Okay. That's, so I just want to add one more. There are wipes also available. If a patient can take a bath, it is good. But there are chlorhexidine wipes available with alcohol, which they can just wipe on the leg. That's also another good thing. Um, pre-operatively, if we do that, it certainly helps. Second question, uh, Nilayne, is what is your cocktail formula to reduce the pain management? Uh, one so is it the Randomer cocktail? I think it's a little difficult for me to offhand remember, but all patients get Kenacot, they'll get mm. uh, Ropivacaine, and mm. they will get an antibiotic. These three things. Right. Uh, I think with uh, Ketorolec. Yeah, with Ketorolec, with uh, Adrenaline and uh, Clonidine. I think there's a Ranavat cocktail which is there. Mm. So there is another yeah. question. Uh, what is your opinion regarding Arista AH in TKR to decrease the perioperative blood loss? Yeah, uh, I actually just reviewed a paper. I didn't know what Arista AH was. But I was asked to review a paper about Arista AH. And Milan, let me be honest. I, I, I don't know even today. So better you tell us. Oh, oh, oh. It is some kind of mucopolysaccharide. Okay which can be used the way we use tranexamic acid. So okay. I had not heard of it, but as I said, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to review a paper. So I just read the paper and the conclusion of that paper is that it is not better than tranexamic acid. All right. Okay. So the last question is, if patients ask about roadmap to recovery, what will you explain then? Yeah. So, Typically, I say that bed rest is maybe four to six hours. They'll start walking the day of the surgery. Hospital stay post-surgery is typically a day. They'll be able to go home the next day. Some people stay two days. It takes six to eight weeks for 60 to 80 percent of relief from knee replacement. By that I mean that they'll have to take occasional, not occasional, pretty regular paracetamol with an occasional NSAID for the first six to eight weeks. But the total recovery from knee surgery is three months to one year. That's what I tell them. Hey. Hi. Uh, Dr. Vikrambhai, somebody asked you, when will I be become normal? What will be your answer? The patient sometimes asks, when I will be sub cub normal cub me kam kar sakunga. So what is your usual time period you give them? Dr. Vikram? Is it for me or for Nilan? No, 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 for you. What if he has already told? So if somebody patients ask you, Kisab me kab tiko jaunga when I will be fit. So what is the realistic time period we give them? You know what I answer them? Whether you are doing good or not is all in your mind. Patients who are working and looking forward to a good life, active life, they get better faster. 
the people who come crying in the hospital remain crying for long, long time people who come who are looking forward to a good quality of life they become fast they get better faster to jo rote rote aate hain wo lambe time rote rehte hain jo haste haste aate hain wo jaldi haste haste jaate hain to i put on us all them i put on us them how well prepared you are for surgery you want surgery or your relatives want surgery because hmm. you are burden to him them hmm. correct correct so, so that so that makes you know my life easier relatives life easier because they are also very happy because they are not able to tell that person anything correct hmm. fine uh, dr raja uh, what is the news on uh, dr vijay bose yes yeah, john already i am here i am here yeah vijay i think uh, um uh, uh, uh i just take opportunity to thank uh, uh, nilain it was a wonderful talk and with a good question much. answer and discussion so um on behalf of uh, dr danasekar raja my colleague dr vikram shah dr pachore and all the members of the is executive committee um we should thank you for sparing time and giving your thoughts on this so thanks dr nilain and dr raja can you take over and introduce dr vijay bose okay. thank you for having me thanks okay um i think dr dhanushekar is in a meeting same meeting we are both of us in the same meeting my apologies for joining late so no dr. problem vijay raja may not be able to join so i uh, vijay i i have uh, um honor to introduce you in one sentence that everybody knows vijay bose <laughs> i don't think i need to i need to say anything more Uh, it's a, it's a extreme pleasure for the uh, all of us and i'm very sure the all young surgeons those who have joined so on behalf of uh, dr vikram dr pachore and myself and of course dr raja uh, we thank you for accepting the invitation for this teaching program and uh, uh, i know you are busy and just running between the two lecture halls so please uh, uh, share your screen and uh, your thoughts on the acetabular revision yes. part thank thank dr dave for the kind introduction and uh, always been uh, very close to ix and uh, dr pachore in particular um okay so let me share my screen as real uh, uh, opportunity for me and a privilege uh, for being invited for this program thank you very much um okay what is this that is this my thing is not coming yeah got it can you see my slides please yes we can right great so today i'll be talking about the revision astablum a practical guide and algorithm what we are doing today in 2023 so most talks you know we have these conferences we have all these talks on revision astablum and usually you know the speaker would uh, tell you all about the different classifications and you know in in detail and also they will also tell you about all the implants available that's available that's all fine but the what they really the um, uh, the trainee or the junior surgeon wants to know is uh, what to do for a particular case you know and that's really the the crux of the whole thing and not a you know week passes when i don't get a couple of queries by email or uh, whatsapp asking sir this is the patient and this is the revision i have and uh, how should i manage that so just by knowing all the classifications and knowing all the um, various implant available in india today it doesn't mean that we can you know uh, tackle a case so the real value for knowledge is for the which particular case which you can do so when somebody sends by whatsapp and x-ray i tell them you do this you do this now that's not rocket science that's based on very simple principles and hopefully by the end of this talk everyone will be able to you know sort of gauge it for themselves and they need not ask uh, seniors as what well do about a particular case so the important thing about it is the algorithm right so uh, paprosky classification is the one that is used uh, 
uh, almost universally now the important thing about that is you know there are various things i have not going to the classification today but the most important thing is is the migration yeah so when you find that you know as you go up the peprovsky types the migration gets more and more and we becomes 3a becomes 3 a up and out and uh, 3b is up and in that we know so um, from um, two uh, the differentiation point between 2 and 3 is the columns are still intact in 2 although walls are deficient but once it goes to 3 there's usually the columns are non supported so that's the uh, the crux of the uh, uh, of the paprovsky classification so the columns are intact in type 2 and uh, as you go to type 3 the columns are are are, thing, are, are uh, distorted and the migration as you you know as we uh, is less than 3 cm in type 2 and usually more than 3 cm approximately in type um, 3 that's the uh, the essence of the classification so if you from what i said type 2 means proximal migration is less than 3 cm columns are intact but walls may be deficient and so the it's divided into a b c based on whether the remodeling of the bone uh, on 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 bone loss the circumferential remodeling or the oblong remodeling or the protrusio type remodeling type 3 we said the columns are also deficient and a would be 3a would be up and out and 3b would be up and in and type 4 represents the pelvic discontinuity so that's very simple that we have that so we will tackle this algorithm very simply so paprovsky 1 we said why is paprovsky 1 because the migration is less than 3 cm you can see the columns are all in the ct scan the columns are all intact therefore is almost like a primary therefore uh, any standard cup you can put in a uh, paprovsky 1 whatever cup that i used to uh, there is uh, any cup will work in a paprovsky 1 so that's very simple uh, thing to do and that's what i have done i used a standard uh, primary cup and things will uh, so the, there's no bone loss rims are intact and there is uh, little or no migration in Paprovsky 1. Very simple thing too. Algorithm is very simple for Paprovsky 1. Now Paprovsky 2, as we said, you can see the migration is now more. But the key point is it is less than 3 centimeters. So it's not a type 3, it's a type 2. Migration is less than 3 centimeters. There is certainly some wall losses there. But the columns are intact. Okay. Therefore, now, so the algorithm is that today uh, in 2023, Whenever you have a Paprovsky 2, the go-to uh, method that you are reconsidering is a jumbo cup. I will talk about jumbo cup, but so a jumbo cup by essence should be a highly porous cup. So a standard cup that you use, you know, whether you use a pinnacle or anything, that's that's not good enough. You must go move into a highly porous cup because your post bone contact is going to be limited when you start using a jumbo cup concept. I'll, I'll talk about the jumbo cup concept. So you can see that I've done a jumbo cup reconstruction here. How do I know it's a jumbo cup? You can see the uh, socket on the other side. You know, it's uh, this socket that I have revised. It's a much bigger socket than the uh, other side. Therefore, it's a jumbo cup. If it's a much bigger, usually about 8 to 10 millimeters bigger than the other side, then it becomes a jumbo cup. So that's the jumbo cup that we have now. So you can see it's much larger than the native size that you can see from the other side. So this is what you mean by a jumbo cup. And this is the go-to reconstruction modality whenever you have a type 2. Type 2, I told you, columns are intact, migration less than 3 uh, centimeters. So the host bone contact in jumbo cups, you can see that, you know, uh, the uh, because the host bone contact can be limited, I told you you need to put a highly porous cup. So you can see that typically a lot of uh, uh, cup would be uncovered. So the host bone contact would be limited. So it's absolutely mandatory whenever you're using the jumbo cup principle that you must use a highly porous cup. You can see in this example how much of the cup is uncovered. So with a modern highly porous cup, you can go to maybe only 60% enough. Maybe, you know, with a tantalum cup, you can go even up to, you know, 40%, 30% like that. So, um, you can see another example of a Paprovsky 2. Significant oscillation is there, but migration less than uh, centimeters. So, I now, well, how do I, very simple. I use a jumbo cup. You can see it's much bigger than the native size of the socket. I've used a lot of uncovering is going to be there. So, I've used a highly porous cup. And that is a jumbo cup reconstruction again I have done. So you can see that jumbo cup reconstruction. So uh, uh, subtypes are there in the uh, Paprovsky classification depending on the remodeling of the bone. So we can, the migration is less than 3 centimeters because only type 2 still. So circumferential remodeling we call 2A. If it's oblong remodeling we call it 2B. And if it's protrusive type remodeling we call it 2C. So all these things have been now reconstructed with the jumbo cup. Highly porous cup, put as many screws as you can. It is much larger than the other side. Now, we're only dealing with a type 2 Paprovsky here. So, it's very simple. I think everyone got the message that the go-to option in a type 2 would be a jumbo cup. 
Now, what is the principle of the Jumbo Cup? That's very important to understand. So here is a defect. You can see the, you know, because the defect usually is superior. And therefore, you know, the, the, the shape of the socket is much more longer in the superior inferior axis than in the AP axis. So you can see the typical defect. So get a large uh, superior inferior defect. So uh, this would be a standard cup. But because I'm putting a jumbo cup, I'm going on expanding till I get, uh, you know, now what you call as a third point fixation. So now we have got a, we have the, the cup size now matches the larger superior inferior diameter. And therefore, you have to probably remove a little more, a little bit of the anteroposite diameter, but that's fine. Two millimeters we remove. Now we are matching the circular socket to the large superior inferior diameter. And that's why it's called the jumbo cup because the diameter is much larger than the native size where, where both the diameters are equal. And then you put screws. And these days we recommend that you put in the, in the lower hemisphere as well. You put in the ischium and the pubis. If you can put screws, that'll be great. And that's a typical jumbo cup reconstruction. And you can see that, you know, this is a case that I've done a jumbo cup. And you can see that I put, uh, I'll show you the x-rays. Uh, I put inferior screws as well. So now we come to Paprovsky 3, when migration is more than 3 centimeters. You can see now from the teardrop, the migration is more than 3. If it is up and out, it becomes 3As, up and in becomes 3B. So an additional columnar bone, that's the key differentiating, but columnar bone loss is present. So 3As up and out, 3As in fact. So significant uh, craniolateral migration indicates that the posterior column is lost. Another important tip, tip here is we find that, you know, it's a, a lateral 3A. It goes laterally, there's a posterior column loss. And if there is a craniomedial migration or type 3B, then there is an anterior column loss. So also it tells you just by the x-rays what you're going to see here. So if a rule of thumb is that if migration is more than 3 centimeters, one cannot get a third point by upsizing before running AP. I'll just show you this. So you will have to bring the third point down. That's the principle behind it. So here is the illustration for that. So now we say, okay, now I have a, uh, now it's not no more a two defect, it becomes three defect. That means there's a very large superior inferior diameter relatively narrow AP diameter. Okay, now without knowing this, you're going to put a jumbo cup, but you run into a problem. So as you keep expanding this, as expanding it, try to get a third point superiorly, you'll find that you're running out of columns here. So that's a big no-no, because when you try to get a third point by expanding your cup size, you'll run, up, you'll run out of AP bone. So this is a big no-no. So this is when you should not be doing a jumbo cup reconstruction. So what do you do? You, once you uh, uh, match the columns, once you have reached the AP diameter, you must stop. Now, since you can't go to the third point, you bring the third point down by using an augment. So that's the very, that's the reason why we use augment. Because the cup cannot go and reach the third point superiorly, we bring the third point down. How do you bring it down? We use an uh, augment and you put screws in the augment. So here is a defect, you can see that. And uh, that's the augment that we have. You can see that it's a large defect. It's a 3A defect. Therefore, I couldn't uh, do a jumbo cup. So I put a, 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 a highly porous cup and I brought the third point down by using a tantalum augment here. So the augments can be classified into, I mean, the methods of how we use the augment is the classical mode. You can see the, uh, you know, a classical mode is augment is within cavity. That's the commonest mode that we use the augment. It's an oblong defect with the cavitatory bone loss, but the augment going into the uh, bone loss area into the cavity. And then we can put the augment there nicely, and then we can put a cup inside. So that is your classical mode of using the augment, commonest mode, 80% of the augments we use in this way. Now, uh, sometimes we can use the augments as a flying buttress. Now you find that, you know, you have put, you have put a cup like this, but you find there's a lot of uncovering of the cup. You can see a lot of uncovering of the cup, and therefore we want to increase the host bone contact, and therefore we put the uh, augment like a flying buttress. That's what we do that, okay? Now, when you have a 3B defect, usually there is significant columnar loss and this is when we use a columnar augment or a block buttress augment because you don't have any bone here, we got to borrow bone from the ileum. So typically we have a flat augment that borrows bone from the ileum, otherwise called the extra fixation. We are borrowing bone from the ileum and bringing it down and bringing a support for lodging your cup inside. That's a typical uh, block augment or your columnar augment. You can see an example in which we have used a columnar augment. Now, rarely you can use an augment as a footing where there's a lot of medial loss. You can put a couple of augments and sort of create a medial uh, resistance to your cup. That's called a footing mode. So these are the different modes in which an augment can be used for your socket reconstruction. So when will you use an augment? Type 2 is a jumbo cup. Once you go to type 3, almost universally you need an augment. Now, based on the defect of the intracavity, you use the different modes of augment. 
but once it goes into 3a or 3b you will need an augment so be prepared with an augment now this is something new so the augments uh, in theory are very fine but there have been times when i have you know uh, opened augment i'm sure people here who have done augments would also agree with that but then we find it doesn't fit very well it's too big for a patient population so commonly screw holes do not match the area of bone stock resulting in a very poor hole very commonly it's like a jigsaw puzzle but if you put the augment the cup doesn't sit if you put the cup the augment so it's always a uh, wasting operative time and we are uh, not able to get a secure fixation so we decided to solve this problem as i said you know more as i keep saying in arthroplasty we have to our indian surgeons have to solve indian problems um i'm sure um, uh, you know vikram shah is doing a lot in that aspect and so we should all uh, find indigenous solutions for our problems because our population is different our bone anatomy is different our size is different and the augment start with size 50 it is too big for our population so we devised this augment known as the ccd augment or the custom columnar docking augment where it's a custom made augment which if you send a ct scan the company will give you within 10 days and it's really a breeze to use this so it's based on the you know locking principle and the uh, the, the augment is exactly where it defect is there's no playing around you put the augment and then you put a put the compression screws then you put locking screws which because it's custom made will go exactly into the column and you get a really a fantastic 3d fixation and then you put your dome screws under typical windows for you to put it so you get a really a 3d fixation excellent uh, it's actually uh, 3d printed titanium it's not tantalum but gives an excellent fixation makes your job very easy and it is the operative time significantly a case example we done quite a few now and you can see a pre op plan we used uh, a ccd augment and you can see how uh, easy to do and what a rigid fixation that you get and uh, this is the case example i will just go through quickly in that it comes with a with a plastic model so you can know how to fit your augment you can see that um very easily you can fit and you can see that's how your augment custom augment is going to fit and then i'm going to place that augment there it's got k wire holes where you can put the k wires to stabilize the augment and uh, and then you can screw and because you know it's custom made it'll go right into the column and these are long locking screws and now you see in a second that uh, they'll also tell you what screws to use so it comes with a with a you know an with a you know with a, um, a pdf and you can actually find out what screw to use for which length to use you can see that exactly this screw hole you must use a 50 mm screw etc and it's very safe also because the direction is prefixed and uh, so uh, sorry so th- so it's a very uh, elegant way to use these days the augment yeah now we come to the last bit of it the um, uh, paprosky 4 uh, or the uh, pelvic discontinuity so how do you uh, make out pelvic discontinuity on the on the um, x ray you look for these x ray features you have a transverse fracture line you have medial transplantation of the in- inferior portion of the pelvis there's a break in the iliohistal line there may be a rotation of the hemi pelvis and there's an asymmetric obturator foramen all these are clues to say that hey i'm dealing with the pelvic discontinuity it's very important to pick up pelvic discontinuity and sometimes the x rays are actually better than ct scans to pick up pelvic discontinuity then your whole game plan changes so typically in a revision situation uh, you know you cannot plate the columns because it occurs over a slow process it's a chronic non union so you cannot they are plate this column and try and get uh, this thing about it yeah so we ha- we have the three options available for our uh, uh, thing one is a cup cage or a cup half cage construct a cup in a distraction mode or a custom tri flange cup so your entire option changes so paprosky 2 jumbo cup paprosky 3 you have to use an augment paprosky 4 those options go out these are the three options that you have i'll talk a little bit about this and uh, it's not right ah okay so this is the algorithm for pelvic discontinuity as you can see if the three points are uh, are mobile then it has been made stable by fixation or by distraction okay we talked about the three point fixation in the cup uh, they are mobile in a pelvic discontinuity that's the problem so the first fundamental concept is to make them stable by either fixing it or by distraction mode yeah so you find that if the cup is stable with a large press fit using a large cup then usually we under ream by 5 6 mm sometimes 3 mm and therefore we distract the whole thing so that the fibrous tissue distracts and the whole thing now becomes stable so then you have to put screws in both the hemispheres and then that works so that will be the easiest thing to use you use a large cup 
which you have to use the distraction mode. You can put a, a, a pelvic distractor or you can do it without a distractor also. Where you put a large cup, you under rim by 4-5 millimeters and you are able to distract this non-union into a stable construct. Then if this does not work, then you are looking at a cup cage construct. Okay, I will talk a little bit about the cup cage construct and if that also you find is not possible, then you have no other choice but to have a custom made tri-flange cup. This is the standard protocol anywhere in the world. Now, uh, think about the uh, thing is, suppose if there is a, a stable fracture with a, with a discontinuity, then you have to plate the posterior column, that we know. So, if we have an acute situation like this, then you plate the posterior column, then you can put a cup like this, a BS cup like this. But a cup cage construct, many people misunderstand. They just put a standard cage and call it a cup cage construct. That is not true. The cup cage construct, the first thing that you have to put in is a large cup, a large TM cup or a highly porous cup and put and get bihemispherical fixation first. So this is like a bone graft. This acts like a bone graft. And over this cup, you are bringing a cage, not the other way around. Over the cup, you are bringing in a cage now. Now this cage is to protect this cup from uh, dislodging, from mechanical forces. So this cup stays like you put for bone graft, you put for the cup so that the, the cup is deloaded from mechanical forces and the cup can also integrate. And then you put your polyliner in. That's how a cup cage construct works. Now remember that the, the BS cage, the Bershner cage that is available in India, the Zimmer does not give you the, the, the specific cages. So it's 50 millimeters. Therefore, the cup that you must put must be a minimum 66 millimeters before you can think of a cup cage. Many times in conference people say, I did a cup cage concept. Cup cage concept in India cannot be done unless your cup is a minimum 66. This was described by and published by Dr. Rajesh Malhotra. So we have now covered all this. So type 2 is um, circumcision remodeling, uh, jumbo cup reconstruction, type 3 more than 3 centimeters up. Then you need an augment because you can't go to the third point, you bring the third point down. But you got to recognize pelvic discontinuity. If pelvic discontinuity is there, I told you the algorithm for pelvic discontinuity. So with this algorithm, any revision can be uh, tackled well. You can yourself, there's no need to get expert opinion. You can find out what to do for a particular case and you can execute your plan. Thanks. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Vijay. <coughs> Uh, by the time you see some questions on the chat, I just want to ask, when you use the augment which you showed, what is the protocol for the weight bearing? How does it change? Well, uh, like in any augment and a complex reconstruction, you need to have six weeks of uh, you know partial weight bearing or toe touch weight bearing till it integrates because we want to deload this. We don't want you know uh, load acting immediately on that. And once the Austin integrate occurs, it Austin integrate occurs very rapidly because these are 3D printed tantalum like augment, so very rapid augment, then you can start weight bearing on that. Yeah. As personally, we have heard you number of times in the conferences, but, but for the benefit of the, the young colleagues, those who have joined here, just want to know your opinion. Instead of augments, you always say that bone grafting or a large chunk of a femoral head bone graft is not a good option. Can you just comment? Yes. So, um, you know, earlier on the concept before the augments, uh, the uh, uh, structural bone grafting. So you can, so don't get me wrong. So when you want to fill up, for example, putrusio, some bone, that's all fine. That's all not structural bone graft. But when you do a structural bone graft, put on that uh, by structural bone graft, by definition means if that bone graft does not integrate, your whole concept will fail. That's a structural bone graft. So when you use a structural bone graft, uh, the success rate is limited, especially in the medium term. So it seems to work well. But at about five to seven years, they all fail. And so Alan Gross, who has done more uh, you know, sexual bone grafting than anybody, Alan Gross himself has said, you must not do structural bone grafting in arthroplasty on the socket side. The only exception is when you have a post establishment fracture situation, you're doing an arthroplasty, when you have the own femoral autograph. So we will never have autograph you know, for obvious reasons. But when you have the autograph, femoral head, it works very well. Not allograph. Uh, autograph post acceptable fracture, you're doing that, that sexual graft works very well. But apart from that, if you use a sexual graft, the chance of failure is very, very high. So we have all moved on to world over. We have moved to usage of augments. It's a much more reliable fixation that you get than sexual bone grafts. Dr. Pachore, we need your... Vijay. Yes, Dr. Pachore. It was a great talk. I learned quite a lot of things <laughs> and you made it very simple for the people. Absolutely fantastic talk. I must congratulate you. Thank you so much, Bajore. And I uh, just wanted to know what is your experience with this Exetec, uh, which 
because uh, every time the zimmer uh, is not available cup and cage uh, that the what about the role of exatec which is uncemented which has got flanges which has got a hook uh, and it probably uh, it we use it for pelvic dissociation what you mentioned was a uh, proposky four what's your uh, thoughts on that well you know this is the peter brom uh, cage and i've been to peter brom and all the designers and they very clearly say that you must not use it in pelvic discontinuity it's not meant to be discontinuity so the what we follow now in india is the american school of thought where we you know when there is a type 3 defect we generally use a cup and a augment but the german philosophy is that they will use something like a cage here an osteo integrating cage this is an alternative for using augment in type 3 peproski it is not for pelvic discontinuity is a very very important point here so we should not be using it in pelvic discontinuity but if that's your philosophy of, of you know that you have to uh, that that you know use an osteo integrating cage instead of an augment german philosophy that's fine you can use it but it does not and especially in a protrusive type situation you know and when you have protrusive type i find that exatec cage very useful peter brom actually but certainly not for a for a paproski 4 not for pelvic discontinuity and the designers themselves say that very clearly yeah there's no ambiguity about it yeah Vijay, can you look at the chat, or shall I ask the question? What has been written? Yeah, can please ask the question. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll also look at the chat. Yeah. yeah. In case chat. of socket size being forty-six mm with pelvic discontinuity, how can we reconstruct such cases as cup cage can be used with sixty mm only? You cannot. That's why cup cage cannot be used. So, uh, if it is forty-six, you try and see whether you can get the. an end point the distraction you can get an end point if you want to do it a controlled manner you use a pelvic distractor put two screws across the discontinuity and distractor and then you see whether there is an end point if there is no end point then that option will not work if there is an end point say it distracts 4 5 6 mm that's great then you put a big cup inside and then once you take the distractor off it all collapses back into again or you can gently ream and 5 6 mm less And gently tap your uh, cup. The cup itself will will distract your pelvis distraction. That means there's fibrous tissue at the non-union level at the pelvic discontinuity level. That will work well. But if that doesn't occur, then you are basically looking like a custom tri flange cup. Because for our patients, this cup cage construct is almost impossible because we need a 66 mm cup. That's huge. Some male patients we may get away with it, but for most patients, uh, availability because we don't have the Zimmer uh, cage with us. we are all we are stuck we cannot use it for our patients yeah, another question is for the ccd augments do yeah. we need to send them the C, cd uh, the ct scan uh, cd and to whom to contact yeah the the website is there it's the jajal medical uh, online you can go and you get upload your ct and the lead time is 10 uh, 10 days so they will give you the augment within 10 days and then you can put the augment in yeah so it's all online now there's no need for sending a cd and all that yeah Doctor Pachore, no, that's okay. Uh, um, that's okay. Yeah. Any, and there's I another think, question uh, saying uh, any particular size that can be labeled jumbo cup. So this is what I know. I'm very uh, fond, you know, that we are all following the American principle, but our sizes are all different, you know. So we cannot call that, uh, you know, American definition is more than sixty sixty sizes of jumbo cup. But we can have a jolly well fifty cup that is jumbo cup. So generally, it's about you know if it's six uh, millimeters more than your 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 cup a native cup on the other side, then it can jumbo cup. So it's a principle that matters that you're expanding you know the AP diameter to match the large superior inferior diameter. That's the jumbo cup principle. But real size doesn't matter. So what is the other to whom to call? Okay, that that we have answered and uh, label jumbo cup. So the principle you have to understand what is in a jumbo cup. and the the more porous material you use you in type 2 so you're talking about gripsion or tantalum cup uh, that's correct for the that's type correct, 2 yeah. with multi hole hmm. multi hole is also very important but the idea of using a highly porous cup is the amount of for example use a standard cup say using pinnacle pinnacle may need up to 75 to 80% of host bone contact for it to survive but once you start using gripsion the host bone contact can be 60 or 50 so that's a huge advantage for you so you got to bring it down so by now using tantalum cups people say you can go up to 30% only 30% of host bone contact is enough it's still osteo integrate yeah so you know at the more um, you know in the, the highly porous it is 
the more the less is your host bond contact required for long term success dr pachore your opinion on tantalum material your what is your experience i think there is no question that what he mentioned there is a lot of uh, frictional resistance which has got this tantalum cup and they will osteointegrate very rap rapidly there is no question. only the problem is the cost factor but uh, we don't consider the cost factor what for the patient actually so definitely when the post bone contact is less than 50% maybe i would go for 60% not the 30% what vijay said but uh, then the use of tantalum cup is much much uh, better better choice yeah dr vikram was saying something yeah <clears throat> you know tantalum is a heavier metal than titanium and uh, zimmer has a patent for it so they are making tantalum uh, related uh, knee and hip augments rest of the companies are making titanium selective laser melting yeah you can 3d it is easier to make 3d printed now so even the ccd augments are 3d printed now no. the zimmer zimmer has got a patent the patent has actually expired or uh, not only a patent it has got they can manufacture only in one facility in the us because highly new jersey new jersey i have seen jersey, that factory yeah. i have seen that factory 10 15 years back okay and you know sponge you you know sponge we use yeah they burn it without oxygen so it becomes black and then tantalum hydrochloride gas is thrown over this uh, black uh, sponge that gets deposited over it and that is the tantalum that's the that's the tantalum hydrochloride gas is thrown over this black uh, sponge having said this selective laser melting technology has come now and it is going to change our knees and hips in coming time even you will get your knees also femoral component and tibial component also made up of selective laser melting it will take some time 5 years at least and maybe 10 years to come in india having said this bone in growth in tantalum and titanium porous is same nothing is better than other so there is no cause of worry using one or the other yes it is a macro structure that earlier we used to think that is actually got tantalum has got osteoconductive properties but that has been proven wrong is only the macro structure the mechanical exactly. properties of tantalum that really matters exactly a similar thing we use in the cone in the the bone defect in the knee absolutely absolutely same same principle yeah correct so i think uh, um we are just uh, reaching at the uh, uh, end of the time um, i on behalf of dr vikram shah the managing trustee president dr sharan patel dr leo joseph secretary dr pachore our patron my colleague dr danashekar raja myself and all the executive members of the isc uh, body uh, i thank vijay for uh, spending your time and giving uh, uh, your valuable inputs on the topic of the acetabular bone defects um, you are busy and you still managed to come at one stage we got the time that probably you may not be able to make it but really we thank you uh, for making it and thank you for all this uh, to all our colleagues uh, please spread this message of his lecture to all your colleagues uh, and friends all the senior faculty is very eminent um, they are coming here and giving you the talks on the various topics our the next lecture is on 6th of january we have dr leo joseph and dr krishna kiran that are going to give talks on hip and knee subjects at the same time again i remind all the friends to go for the early bird registration we have a special uh, uh, packages for the postgraduate students also the 5th 6th and 7th april calcutta we have the is annual uh, conference and i can assure you and i'm telling you uh, very eminent the faculties from australia from uk from usa from germany are going to be there along with the the who's and who of the india 
the biggest faculties and the, the most experienced people from the indian uh, faculty is going to be there uh, with uh, lots of uh, case discussions video techniques live surgeries and a very uh, nice uh, academic program uh, is been prepared so please uh, do join get yourself register if any problem you have please contact us um, and i take this opportunity to once again thanks dr nilin and dr vijay bose dr vikram dr pachore dr dana sekar raja and next time we will be meeting again on 6th of january uh, for the next uh, academic program uh, till then uh, i thank everybody and say good night to you thank you thank you good night thank you thanks hello here leave the hey. webinar yeah